everyone. Thanks for being here with us. Um, I'm Heather Han Sullivan. I'm the Director of Development and Marketing with Dunes Learning Center. And um, joining me tonight is Erin Crofton, our Director of Education at Dunes Learning Center. Aaron. Hello. So if you have any technical issues, um, feel free to um, reach out to either one of us and we'll be happy to help you. Um, and as Erin said, we are recording this evening, so make sure you smile. Um, I will, um, I've got just a few things to go through before we introduce our guest speaker, but um, thank you all for being here tonight. Um, and thank you as well to our sponsors. So um, our series of community education workshops is sponsored by the National Park Service, the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, and tonight's program is also sponsored by the Indiana Lake Michigan Coastal Program, which is a program of the Indiana Department of Natural Resources and the National Ocean Oceanographic and Associate and Atmospheric Association. There we go. They have just the longest name ever. So, but the Indiana Coastal Program, we're grateful for their support um, of citizen science programming. Um, also want to thank our corporate sponsors. Uh, we have a, a great list of folks um, who are supportive of Dunes Learning Center and everything we do. So we're very grateful to all of them for their continued support. Some Zoom basics. Um, please keep yourself on mute during the session. Um, if you have questions, um, please put those into the chat. And Aaron and I will um, assist with Q and A at the end. Um, but you know, if, if you've got questions or comments, feel free to type them in whenever whenever those come up, and we'll make sure that we um, get some of those asked at the end. Um, you can change your camera and your view if you like the um, you know the Brady Brady Bunch style boxes or whatever you prefer. Um, and we're not, we're not doing any pollings. Um, as, as I said, we are recording, um, but yeah, let us know if you have any issues and we're happy to help. Please stay till the end because we have um, some great door prizes, but you must be present to win. So um, stick around till the end and we'll, we'll do the prize wheel of fun and see um, who our lucky winners are tonight. Um, I also want to do a land acknowledgement. So we acknowledge and honor the stewardship of the original inhabitants of the area of Dunes Learning Center. So um, those people um, were located on the traditional lands of the Botawadmic and Miamia peoples. Um, and those, this is where, where we work, learn, study, and play. Um, land acknowledgements are an important first step for non-Indigenous people to come into a more respectful relationship with the past present and future of the entire community present in the lands and waters that we call home. So we just want to call attention to um, this place where we live. And this evening, we are delighted to welcome Dr. Allison Sacerdote Velat. She is the curator of herpetology at the Chicago Academy of Sciences, Peggy Notabart Nature Museum. I had the pleasure of working with Allison several years ago. Um, she's been at the Peggy Notabart Nature Museum for about five years um, as the curator of herpetology. And she studies smooth green snakes, which are just the absolute cutest snakes you ever did see. Um, so I know, I know she's gonna share a picture later, um, but also blue spotted salamanders and wood frogs. So um, tonight she'll be telling us all about wood frogs. We're delighted to have her here. So please welcome Allison. We'll get our Hello. Here. There we go. I'll just share my screen again. And you see the toad. Okay. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for the invitation to join you at Dunes Learning Center for this webinar. I'm really excited to talk to everybody about our regional frogs, um, share a bit about their conservation status, their natural history and life cycle, and we'll go through how to identify the 13 species that we have in our region. Um, and certainly we'll be revisiting this lovely toad here. Uh, little bit later on. But um, I thought I'd share a little bit about my background at 
Peggy Notabart Nature Museum. I conduct research that's focused on conserving and restoring populations of amphibians and reptiles throughout the Chicago wilderness region. A lot of my work uh, focuses on kind of county um, managed forest preserve sites and some state managed uh, nature preserves. And I get to work with species as Heather mentioned, like the wood frog up here. Um, we work at the museum to uh, head start populations of blanding turtles. And this adorable little fellow at the bottom is the smooth green snake. And uh, both the wood frog and the green snake are uh, species in greatest conservation need in Illinois. And in Indiana, uh, the green snake is uh, on the threatened and endangered species list there. So a little bit um, more of a critical conservation priority in your neck of the woods. Um, so much of my work focuses on how we can carry out conservation practices like reintroduction. We examine disease um, in these populations and how it's affecting their, their population dynamics, their communities. And we're also looking at the response of amphibians and reptiles to habitat management and specifically efforts to restore and improve habitat quality because many of these species are considered to be indicators of good habitat quality. Um, another aspect of my work at the museum that I'll, I'll touch on a couple of times this evening is uh, directing the Calling Frog Survey. And the Calling Frog Survey is a community science program where we train anybody who's interested. You don't have to have prior knowledge of frogs or um, prior involvement with a uh, collection of scientific data, but we train you to go out and collect information on what frogs are breeding in your area. And those data are really important. Um, they're helping to build up a long-term data set so that we can examine trends in our regional frog populations. So the Calling Frog Survey actually started back in 1999, and it was initiated by the Chicago Wilderness Conservation Organization in partnership with Audubon Society, but it moved to uh, Peggy Notabart Nature Museum in 2014, where it joined two other um, conserv uh, community science programs that we run, which include the Illinois Butterfly Monitoring Network and the Illinois Odinate Survey. And initially, um, the Calling Frog Survey was created because this little guy in this photo, photo um, the cricket frog, was at one point the most common amphibian in, uh, in Illinois and one of the more common amphibians in the Midwest. But by the 1960s, uh, they had largely disappeared from about the northern third of the counties in the state. And it wasn't just limited to Illinois. It kind of underwent an enigmatic decline throughout much of the Midwest. And there are a few hypotheses involving disease and habitat fragmentation, um, as well as endocrine disruptors in the environment that have all been proposed as kind of driving factors as to why this species is so limited. Um, so basically we, we want to collect as much data as we can about as many frog populations as we can in real time. And to do that, the best way we can kind of come up with is to have a network of people who are trained to identify the calls of the different frogs and they can visit their sites again and again and collect data on which species are calling there because calling is an indicator that these frogs are trying to breed in this particular wetland. And so we can monitor over time whether any populations seem to be blinking out, whether they're getting larger, whether they're um, colonizing a site after restoration, or whether there's suddenly a problem in the environment. So if that's something you're interested in, um, for this season we've already finished our recruitment. In fact, our, our first round of sampling ends tomorrow. Um, but if you want to get involved for next season, you can visit our website, which is frogsurvey.org, and and we usually post our training dates in January, and then we do workshops to train new monitors in February. So um, we 
basically span as much of the Chicago wilderness region um, as we can. So we have had um, participants in uh, Southwest Michigan. So I know we have one attendee here from Michigan. If you do want to get involved, absolutely let us know. Um, we have quite a few participants in Northwest Indiana as well. And of course the collar counties around Chicago and some years we have participants in Wisconsin. But what we do is we share the data that um, um, the community scientists are collecting about the frog populations on publicly managed lands with the land managers and res resource planners, as well as researchers who are trying to learn more about particular species. So we're basically holding the data that everybody collects in the public trust so that we can all collectively learn more about our regional frog populations and the threats that they're facing, as well as the different trends in their populations. So that begs the question, well, why do we need to monitor frogs? And of course, if you're here, I am going to guess that you already kind of love frogs and just want to know more about them. But um, it's really critical uh, to pay attention to what's happening to frog populations. As I mentioned, they're considered to be an indicator taxa. So they're, they're a group of organisms that are very sensitive to changes in environmental quality, um, specifically because they have very permeable skin. They're sensitive to the presence of pollutants in the environment. So if you have a wetland that's right by a super busy road um, in a kind of colder climate, you might find that there's road salt contamination that affects um, aquatic organisms. And so frogs would be one of the species that might be a sentinel telling us that, hey, there's too much salt pollution running off into our environment. Um, they also are critical because they spend time both in the wetlands and in the surrounding uplands. And I know most of us think of them as associated with ponds, but we have quite a few species that are very terrestrial and actually spend more of their time in the surrounding upland habitat, but they come to the ponds to breed. And so because they're this link between two types of habitats, they're carrying nutrients back and forth. They're moving energy through the ecosystem in that way. And so that's another reason why they're really critical. Additionally, we have to think about their position in the entire ecosystem food web. And frogs are really right in the middle of that food web, whether it's on land or in the water. They're predators, so they're eating a variety of invertebrates and soil arthropods. Some frogs will eat other vertebrates. In fact, I once saw a bullfrog try to eat a starling. Um, so that was something to watch. Um, it was actually when I lived out west and they were both invasive species in that place. But um, but yeah, they will basically try to eat whatever they can fit in their mouths generally. So they are important predators. Uh, they do have kind of a top-down control on a lot of invertebrates, um, but they're also prey species for a number of wading birds. And here in this bottom photo, you see a snake eating a frog. And um, in tropical ecosystems where we've had various amphibian diseases kind of move through and cause very rapid series of extinctions, researchers have found that snake communities that are dependent on those frog populations have actually lost diversity or populations have collapsed because of the lack of frogs. And similarly, their tadpoles um, actually can prevent some algal blooms and cre create um, a lot of control of algal dynamics in tropical stream systems. So when you have, you know, tadpoles that are constantly grazing and then suddenly the population's wiped out, that's really kind of changing the entire aquatic ecosystem. So their position can have impacts in both directions in the food web, both higher predators and the species that they're feeding on as well. So. Unfortunately, there have been many threats to frog populations and amphibian populations in general. Um, unfortunately, we have lost about 158 species in the last two and a half decades. And the biggest driver for loss and extinction of frogs is habitat loss and fragmentation. So direct destruction of their environment, but also the breakup of their environment. So carving habitat into smaller pieces makes it harder for them to carry 
carry out their life cycle. If, if you have a road that divides a wetland from a forest, that's going to make it harder for them to move back and forth into both habitat types that they rely on. Um, and habitat loss and fragmentation are really the biggest drivers of loss of biodiversity of any species, but um, amphibians are certainly no exception. Now with amphibians, we do have um, several emerging diseases and some diseases that have been around a little bit longer that have been impacting their populations. Uh, one which is um, certainly present in our region is called titridiomycosis. And this is caused by a waterborne fungus called chytrid fungus. And um, it basically um, binds to keratin and it breaks down the keratin in the frog's skin. And because they have permeable skin and respire through their skin, that can cause a lot of um, impacts to their physiology and it can affect survival. It's not um, causing mass die-offs in our area and there are different strains of the fungus. So, um, we've found that there are you know, more, more kind of aggressive strains and then some that seem to be a little bit more endemic that the frogs seem tolerant of. And that seems to be the strain that we have in our area, but it is something that we do surveillance with in our research. We monitor the zoospore load of the frogs that we encounter to see it, if those numbers are spiking up or down and if that's impacting the numbers of frogs that we're catching. Um, there's also a variety of um, aquatic viruses like ronavirus, which affects frogs um, and salamanders. It also affects turtles and fish. And a lot of these are waterborne. There's waterborne bacterial diseases that can impact them. So they have a lot of stressors. And what we tend to find is that the more environmental stressors there are, like pollution and habitat fragmentation, the more immune suppressed they become. And that's when you tend to see the disease impacts kind of worsen. Um, additionally, invasive species are a problem, um, whether it's plants or animals in their case, um, invasive species being introduced to new ecosystems have the, the basically the power to displace a lot of native species um, and outcompete native species or just vastly change the habitat structure. So in many of our study sites, we deal with an invasive shrub called the European buckthorn, and it grows really aggressively around the breeding ponds of frogs. And it can actually siphon up quite a bit of water from those wetlands as it's growing. And so it makes those pools dry down faster compared to what our native shrubs do. And so that impacts the amount of time that the tadpoles have to get through metamorphosis. So that's just one example example of how um, invasive species can impact them. And then, of course, we have, um, you know, frogs are ectotherms and climate change is going to impact um, ectothermic species, particularly because their activity patterns and behaviors are subject to what's going on with temperature and what's going on with water. And the more frequent drought we have that impacts amphibian populations quite severely. Um, similarly, if we don't get enough snowfall, we don't have that recharge of our wetlands that they really need in early spring. Um, one of the other threats that we do have, um, it's not quite as big a threat in our area, but it is still a threat, is exploitation where people do illegally collect them or sell them, trade them. Um, we don't think of that as something that's happening with our, our local species, but there have been people you know, arrested at airports smuggling blue spotted salamanders and Blanding turtles and other um, regional species that you wouldn't think, oh, who's buying these? But there are people who are doing that and they're taking species out of our native ecosystems for, for profit. Um, and so that is a problem that we have to be aware of. But um, generally in our region, um, the Midwestern states have lost the greatest percentage of our original kind of pre-European settlement wetland acreage. In Indiana, we've lost about 87% of wetlands. And in Illinois, we've lost about 85% of our wetlands. And during the 1930s, as land was being converted, um, there was a lot of agricultural drainage tile installed and many of the wetlands that once occurred were, were basically replaced with artificial farm ponds. And these farm ponds were often stocked with predatory fish. And so amphibians, many of our early breeding amphibians do not 
not coexist in ponds that have fish. Um, they're, they're vulnerable to the fish eating their eggs and eating their tadpoles. So um, it's not a one for one replacement in that way. Um, and as we had kind of more intensification of agriculture expanding, we also had more fertilizer and pesticide runoff that does impact um, the remaining wetlands on the landscape and impacts the frog populations in those areas. So there are many initiatives, of course, in our region to try to restore um, wetland complexes like the Great Kankakee Marsh and um, basically many wetlands throughout our region, um, smaller and larger scale. Um, but the problem that we still have, despite the effort to really try to restore the hydrology of these sites, is that we still have roads. Um, and so as we have suburban and urban sprawl, we have an obstacle for amphibians to get from point A to point B. These are not species that have um, very good dispersal abilities because of the permeability of their skin. They can only move under certain conditions and they can only move through certain types of habitats. Um, so it does become quite challenging for them to persist. And so all of these are reasons why we, we monitor these populations. And so this is just a snapshot of some of the data from our uh, calling frog survey. So all of this information was collected by community scientists in a season. And so all of these individual dots represent um, different monitoring sites where we have people out listening for frogs. So it's great to see all of those individual data points and each color represents a different species. Um, and so some of these are on top of each other so you can't quite see how diverse a particular site is in this, in this single figure. Um, but you might notice we also have a category for none seen or heard. So if somebody goes out to a wetland and they don't hear anything, don't see any frogs, we still want to know that because that negative data informs our conservation information. It tells us that, hey, there's habitat here, there's a wetland here, but no frogs are using it. And then that can inform kind of a landscape analysis. What's going on in that area? Um, are there barriers to movement? And how might we come up with conservation strategies to address that, to restore populations or help frogs occupy and colonize those sites? So when we think about the habitat for frogs, um, we have a variety of aquatic habitats. We have flowing water like streams and rivers, but more commonly when we're thinking of breeding habitat for frogs, we have standing water. So uh, we can have ponds, lakes, marshes, swamps, and ditches. And um, these standing water bodies are going to be chosen by different species that have different kind of life history requirements. So some species like our early breeding uh, guys that we're gonna start off talking about really like those temporary shallow bodies of water that we usually call vernal pools or ephemeral ponds. They're called vernal pools because they fill up basically with the autumn rain and winter snow and then in spring they melt and amphibians can use those as a, um, a breeding site. And the benefit of these breeding sites to frogs is that fish can't survive in a temporary pond. So they're free of that kind of predation pressure. Um, so they do have a race against time because if it's a drought year, that pond is gonna shrink much more quickly. So they have to try to speed up their development rate and get out in time. Um, so some species breed a little later, some species use semi-permanent ponds and some species that are larger bodied like bullfrogs will use permanent bodies of water to lay their eggs. And when we think about the life history of the frogs, there's a few different components. Um, that term amphibian refers to the two phases of their life cycle. Um, and again, that's one of the things that makes them an important uh, ecosystem indicator. Um, so during spring, the males will start calling when they get to the pond um, and try to attract a female. And uh, this will be a female wood frog in this image. And so when the male grasps the female um, to mate, that's called amplexus in frogs. And they have external fertilization. So he'll coax her to try to release the eggs and he'll fertilize the eggs as she releases them into the water and she will attach them, oops, she will attach them to submerged vegetation. Um, and depending on the species, they could take um, as short as four days to hatch up to about two weeks to hatch. So species like spring peepers and uh, boreal chorus frogs only need about 
four days for hatching. Um, species like leopard frogs, it's more like two weeks. Um, and you have kind of anywhere in between for some of the other species. One thing that affects hatching rate is the water temperature. So the colder the water is, the slower the development will be. Um, but you know, it's it's kind of um, a double-edged sword. You don't want it too warm um, because that can rob the oxygen of water. Colder water holds more oxygen and they need that oxygen for the embryos in those, those kind of gelatinous masses to develop. So once they hatch, they form an aquatic larva um, that will referred to as tadpoles, but uh, salamanders have aquatic larvae as well. And um, once the pond does start warming up um, and the dissolved oxygen in that water starts dropping off, that tends to cue a bunch of hormonal changes in the tadpoles. And that will actually um, stimulate the growth of their hind limbs. They do have developed front limbs at this point, but it's enclosed in a sheath in the front of their body that's called an operculum. And once they're ready, those front legs will pop out and they go through a massive restructuring of, of their entire mouth and the shape of their head. They go from having these kind of keratinous sheets that they use to graze on algae and periphyton um, growing in the water and on surfaces of logs into um, a more kind of standard gulping frog looking mouth. And they'll resorb their tail and move on to land at that point. And as they go from this larval stage to this metamorph stage, they actually first build up keratin in their skin. They only have keratin on their mouth when there are tadpoles. So for these frogs, adults can be either fully aquatic, semi-aquatic, or terrestrial, um, but they all need water in order to lay their eggs. So depending on how much time they spend on land or off in the woods or in the, in the prairie, they still need to come to water in order to breed. And so this is a male wood frog who's kind of hanging around a communal oviposition site. So a lot of the frogs, um, like wood frogs and leopard frogs, tend to lay all of their egg masses is in one area and males will try to chase each other away. Um, and these, I know it's a little bit harder to see, these tiny little poppy seed sized dots are uh, chorus frog eggs and they lay them in small frog and leopard frog eggs is they have these kind of discrete, almost baseball size masses. And we can use that as a direct count of the number of breeding females in the population because each female produces one large cluster of eggs. With many of the other species, they kind of like to have their eggs strewn all over the pond. So it's not a direct count, but we can get really nice population information um, using those eggs. So Again, the, those tadpoles, they're feeding um, on mostly an herbivorous diet as they develop. They're grazing on algae and biofilm. But again, those adults are going to be carnivorous. They have shift in diet as they go through metamorphosis. And frogs as adults are primarily nocturnal. They can be seen and heard if it's kind of cloudy and overcast during the day or if you're around a wetland, but they're not really going to be moving as much in the terrestrial habitat unless it's nightfall and they have more cover um, because they are uh, susceptible to desiccating. So in terms of the ways they communicate, this is um, one of the ways that we can sample which species are present in our area. They make different types of calls. And the main call that we listen for is called an advertisement call. And that's the call the male is doing to try to attract a mate. Um, they'll also make some aggressive calls, which will be when they're in a little turf battle with another male. Um, if they're actually wrestling with another male, which the wood frogs do a lot to get access to a female, or or um, once they're uh, finished mating, they let go of each other. That's they make a sound called a release call. Usually when males are doing the advertisement call and a female responds and starts moving closer, they slightly modify the call and it's almost a softer, more muted version of the main advertisement call um, once she's, she's close by. Um, occasionally you'll hear like alarm or startle calls when a predator walks up. So if we were to walk up to the edge of a wetland when there's a green frog or two sitting there, you'll hear a little squeak where it goes like, like that, and they'll jump into the water. Um, so that's an alarm call. And occasionally you'll actually hear something get caught by a predator and they do make a kind of squeal or scream, which is very unpleasant to hear. Um, but, you know, it's it's part of the ecosystem and they're, they're 
fulfilling that middle of the food web role. So we have 13 species in our region and we'll go through um, these species in the order that they call their phenological order um, that we tend to hear them throughout the year. And if you want a copy of this chart, you can download it at our website, which is frogsurvey.org. Um, what's cool about this is if you're trying to first learn different frogs, um, in order to monitor, or you're just curious as to what's out um, at this point in the season, this chart will help you because you don't have to learn all 13 at once. You can start with what's active right now and, you know, focus on three or four at a time. And it makes it much easier to, to kind of get accustomed to it. Um, it also tells you something about the habitat types that these frogs are going to be found in. So all of these species that are in our kind of round one of our uh, calling frog survey program that breed between February and the end of April, all use temporary ponds in order to lay their eggs. So these are species that we're going to find in wooded vernal pools and temporary prairie ponds and things that are going to dry up. These are not species that we're going to find in a big lake or a semi-permanent wetland necessarily. Um, and then our round two species, um, basically starting with the leopard frog and going uh, down to the gray tree frogs, these are kind of our middle of the road species that will use ponds that hold water a little bit longer. So maybe they hold water into September most years rather than July, or some years those ponds may not dry at all. Um, and then these later species that we'll look at, the green frog to the bullfrog, these are late breeding species. So you're gonna find them in permanent water bodies that do not dry because their, their tadpoles take a long time to develop. So knowing that timing tells you something about the habitat that they're associated with. And when we're listening to the calls, which is, is really the best way to learn what, you know, what's out around you, you can think about the types of sounds that they make. Um, frog sounds can be classified as either trills, snores, or barks and chucks. So the trills are our high frequency calls. Um, so this is going to be things like gray tree frogs and spring peepers, um, where frogs are inflating the vocal pouch actually out into the air. So they're sitting in the water, they're sitting on a tree, but the vocal pouch is going out like a balloon and the sound is gonna travel further. The, the frogs that do a snore, like the leopard frog and the pickerel frog, they make these very low frequency kind of droning sounds. And the frogs actually often have two vocal pouches that go out to the side of their head and they're inflating them underwater. So they're not meant for our ears. They're meant for other frogs, right? So um, the sound doesn't carry as far and it can be harder to hear those species unless there are a lot of them calling. Um, and when the trill frogs are calling at the same time, it's hard to hear the snore frogs. Then we have frogs that make barks and chucks, which are still low frequency sounds, but they're short bursts going like wah, 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 like that. That's my wood frog impression. Um, they do this um, by inflating their vocal pouch right below the surface of the water. So it carries a little bit further than the snores, but not as far as the trills. Um, and so you can kind of listen as we go through the calls of the different species and think, is that a trill, a snore, or a bark? So our first frog is the wood frog. And uh, of course, this is my one of my study organisms. And um, they are one of the two earliest species to breed. And they can be really variable in color, anywhere from brown or bronze or copper um, to almost reddish or kind of dark chocolate colored. And they have this um, really characteristic kind of dark robber mask that goes from their snout through the eye and around their eardrum, which is called a tympanum. And they only get to about two inches long. So they're in the same family of frogs as bullfrogs and green frogs, these larger body frogs. So this is the smallest in that group. Um, and these are highly terrestrial. They're called wood frogs because they're forest associated. They like dense tree cover. They spend a lot of time in that leaf litter and they actually overwinter on land. They 
kind of shimmy their bodies into the soil and they build a, a little small burrow called a form and they'll do that underneath the leaf litter and they'll stay there all winter. Now this is the only frog that occurs in uh, Alaska. It's our only frog north of the Arctic Circle. So they're extremely cold tolerant and they can actually have about 65% of the water in their body freeze solid um, and still survive because they'll load a lot of their tissues like their brain and their liver um, with glycoproteins that act as an antifreeze and keep ice crystals from forming in their cells. So really one of the early species that we get. Now we can tell them apart from some of the other similar looking species like the chorus frog, because um, even though a chorus frog, which we'll look at next, also is an early color and also has a dark stripe through the eye, the wood frog has this fold going down its back. And that's called a dorsolateral ridge that separates the dorsum or the back from the lateral part of the, the frog at its side. And so this ridge we'll take a look at in some of the different frogs because that's one of the great ways that we can tell some of the species apart. So as I mentioned, um, this is one of our early breeding species and they will actually still call when there's some ice present on the pond. Now they need open water in order to lay eggs, but um, case in point, um, we just had our wood frogs lay eggs in my study site when it was 28 degrees out. We had skim ice form. It had been open water. There had been one or two males calling and you know we were like, oh, maybe we'll still go out and check. And then the next day there were eggs, but nothing else was active. Um, they really need the soil temperature to be at least 41 degrees to come out of kind of their, their winter torpor. Um, so, you know, people say, oh, well, they'll breed when there's ice, but the soil has to thaw a little bit so that they can kind of wake up from the winter. So in northeastern Illinois, they're extremely rare, um, but their stronghold is northwestern Indiana and uh, southwest Michigan. They're, they're more common there, um, mostly because you still have dune swale habitat. And so they like those shallow pools um, in the dunes in places where there's some wooded areas and there's some flat woods. So they like mesic forests, they like beech maple forests, they like oak hickory forest. Um, and out of our entire survey, and you saw all of those different dots, those different sites that we had, they only occur in between five and 10% of our survey sites. And really um, our Indiana monitors are finding the bulk of them. So um, keep up the good work. Um, and um, certainly uh, this is a species that, that we're really you know, concerned with and trying to restore more populations because they have lost a lot of ground in the Illinois populations, um, particularly. Um, so they are known as explosive breeders, and that means that they're going to only call for about one to seven nights rather than like two months, like the chorus frogs and peepers can call um, for a longer window of time. And so um, they're a tricky one to listen for because you can miss it if it's just a one night, two night event, um, but they'll all come out and kind of fight over mates and they tend to have male biased populations. So it's harder um, for every male to get the opportunity to mate. So there's lots of wrestling over um, over different females that are in the population. Um, so their call, they have one of those bark chuck calls. It's two notes. Um, it sounds a little bit like quacking. Like if, you, if you're familiar with the waterfowl brant, it kind of sounds like a brant calling to me. Um, the textbook de uh, description from these um, you know, recordings that you can listen to, it says that their full chorus sounds like disorganized clatter. And I don't, ever really know how to interpret disorganized clatter. I think of it as like a sink full of dishes falling. <laughs> That's not what they sound like. I think they kind of sound like cartoon laughter. Um, so you can see this, this guy is really dark. You can barely see his mask, but we'll go ahead and listen to their sound. And you can think about how you would remember it. And you can always write down a description like it sounds like this to me. Um, and you can listen to these sounds on our website if you wanna practice. Play, it'll play.
and definitely not one of the trail calls. It's it's this really weird sound, and it when you hear a lot of them, you're like, what is that from a distance? It just sounds like somebody going ah, 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 in the woods. It's it's very strange, but um, great call, great species. Now our next uh, species is the boreal chorus frog, and this is also an early breeding species, and um, they're much smaller. They're about an inch and a half in length and they're members of the tree frog family but they are a little less arboreal than a lot of the other tree frogs that we have in the region and they have these three dark stripes going down their back um, so that's one of the great ways to recognize them and they also do have this dark stripe through the eye but it doesn't quite fan out like we saw in that robber mask in the wood frog they also don't have that dorsolateral ridge they have basically a smooth back with, without that fold going down their back um so these are actually our most common species in the frog survey. We find them um, between 85 and 90% of the survey routes. The only places we don't tend to find them are like in the middle of Chicago. Um, they don't get into extremely urbanized areas. They like forest cover, they like marsh cover. They're generalists when it comes to the amount of trees around them. They'll breed in prairie ponds and breed in marshes and detention basins and roadside ditches. And you'll hear them everywhere, um, but they'll also breed in woodlands. So they're not very picky when it comes to canopy. And this is the species that their, their eggs only take about four days to hatch. So they have a really prolonged breeding window that you could start calling in February and still call into April or May some years. Um, and they're very small. So this is one of the species that you'll hear all around you. And if you try to find, it's kind of maddening, like where are they? Um, but when you're really surrounded, it can be kind of ear splitting because they, they can get pretty loud. Um, and their call is described as somebody running their finger over teeth of a comb. So it's an escalating trill. So you could think about if you were trying to write it as musical notes, it's going to be a series of escalating notes. And we'll go ahead and play that. And one thing I wanted to show you with um, some of these different photos is we we have these oops characteristic um, you know patterns that we expect them to have, but we often find individuals that have aberrations. Um, so this one in the upper corner here barely has any stripes. Um, this one kind of has the letter M on its back. This one's a kind of standard, nice three stripes, but sometimes we find them with squiggles. Sometimes we find them with splotches. And when you tend to see these aberrations, it's often um, an indicator that the population might be becoming inbred um, because of lack of gene flow. And that's when you tend to see more of these kind of um, aberrant patterns. So it's something we see in multiple species, but they are a very widespread species that seems to be able to disperse pretty well. Um, our next early breeding species is a spring peeper, and they usually start calling about two weeks after the boreal chorus frog. So um, if you hear chorus frogs with the fingers on the comb, um, maybe in early March, you might need to wait a week or two before you hear peepers. At least that's, that tends to be the phenology in my area. They might start a little earlier in your area, um, but they're also in the tree frog family. And spring peepers have this distinctive X pattern on their back, and they have this little bar between their eyes. And they're about the same size as the boreal chorus frog. They're about an inch and a half long, but they have um, slightly more adhesive toe pads. They're a little bit more arboreal. So they're climbing more. Um, so I say it's ET fingers. They kind of look like they, they have little ET toes, um, much more so than the chorus frogs. Um, so you're looking for that X and that little stripe between their eyes and then those big toe pads. And here's a few other 
examples where you can see underwater or on land, they can be, some can be really dark in color, some can be more copper, some can be almost gold color, and they do have a slight stripe through the eye. And they're not super common throughout the region, but um, we do have more reports of them throughout Northwest Indiana. Um, but generally, they occur in 40 to 50% of our survey sites. And we are finding that we're seeing more of them um, as some of the oak woodland restoration in our area is happening, where they're kind of opening up tree canopies um, to let more light into the forest. So Spring peepers like forest cover, but they like some light around those temporary breeding ponds that they use because they like to have a lot of emergent vegetation in the pond to lay their eggs on. They lay their eggs individually all over the leaves of the pond. Um, and if the pond, uh, the, the forest canopy above the pond becomes completely closed in, then it limits how much light can get to that pond vegetation. And so they like things to be a little bit more open. Um, again, the chorus frogs are far less picky, um, but that light level seems to be a limiting factor for the spring peepers. Um, so their names are, uh, their name is descriptive. It's, it's saying their call. Um, they say peep or peeper like that. And um, when we listen to this recording, you'll hear the peepers individually. And then when you hear the full chorus, it almost sounds like somebody ringing sleigh bells when you hear them all at once. And then you'll hear a trill that's going to sound kind of like the chorus frog that we just heard, but it's actually the territorial call of the peeper. So it sounds like a chorus frog with a sore throat. That's how I, I tell them apart if it sounds a little raspy. There's the sleigh bells. That's the territorial. So it's kind of a bark and a trill um, for the territorial call versus just the peep and the peeper for the advertisement call that they make. Our next species um, in the order of the year is the northern leopard frog. And this is a member of our, our true frog family, so related to the wood frog in the same family. And uh, these are bigger frogs. They're about four inches in length. And they can be really variable in the color of their backs. So they can be anywhere from tan to kind of emerald iridescent green. And they have um, a brown eardrum or tan eardrum with no spot on it. It's just kind of solid tan. And that's one of the ways we're going to tell it apart from a couple of other similar species. Um, and they have these oblong round kind of ov oval spots with dark brown coloration in them. And they have um, a very prominent dorsolateral ridge, that glandular fold going from their eye all the way down their back to the end of their body. Um, and there's no break in it. So that's one of the ways we'll tell them from some of the other species. And leopard frogs, um, can live in a variety of habitats so, and breed in a variety of habitats. They're more semi-aquatic. So they'll they'll be found in marshes and very open woods. I've seen them lay eggs in wooded sites, but also in prairie ponds and certainly in, in large scale marsh ponds. And again, here are some of those color aberrations that are uh, pattern aberrations I was mentioning um, in uh, some leopard frogs from one of my study sites where those oval spots are basically fusing together into bars. So occasionally you will see some that look like this. And again, that that's um, something that we see when we're dealing with populations in really fragmented habitats. Um, 
So even though they're still locally a common species in our area, um, some leopard frog populations in other parts of their North American range have declined really precipitously. Um, and there's other places where they're kind of swinging back and forth um, from year to year being large populations and small populations. And in fact, um, in the state of Washington, they were once widespread and they are down now to a single population and they're trying to do translocation of of leopard frogs from Idaho into Washington to try to reestablish populations because they just very suddenly um, disappeared. And it's probably disease related. They are a little bit more susceptible to certain pathogens like coronavirus and chytrid. Um, so it's you know, this is another reason why we need people looking out for, for species, whether they're state listed or not. If it's common species, we want to keep those common species common. We don't want to lose part of our natural heritage um, because we're not paying attention. So um, they have a really uh, fun call. It's a snore and a chuck. And so it's a hard one to hear. So they start with a low drone and then it's followed by this chuck sound. So I think it sounds like somebody opening um, a creaky door in like a haunted house, like a with a chuck, chuck, chuck at the end. So you're listening for those two components, the snore and then the chuck. So we'll play that. So when they're all calling together, if you have a large number of them, they can actually start to sound like a revving engine with all those snores together. Um, in 2018, we had a really late spring where you know, temperature was swinging back and forth and most days were below freezing and then we would occasionally get a day where it was above freezing. And when that finally happened, the leopard frogs were so loud, like I've never heard them that loud before, where it was like a kind of sound, um, which is probably where they're getting that leopard term from. When you're only hearing a few of them, it's a hard sound to pick out, especially if the chorus frogs and the peepers are calling at the same time, because it's such a low frequency call, it gets masked and hidden by, um, by those louder calls. So it's something you try to really uh, cue in on and listen for the chuck. Um, sometimes when they're doing a territorial call, they'll just do the chuck part of their call. And that sounds a lot like a wood frog call. And so certainly in Illinois, a lot of people um, think they're hearing wood frogs and they're hearing actually leopard frogs based on the timing of the call and the site. We can usually rule them out. Like oh, if you're in a prairie, it's not going to be a wood frog. Um, but what they're hearing is this chuck, 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 chuck kind of um, over and over again without the snore component. And that's where it gets a little bit tricky to tell them apart. So um, our next species um, in the year is the American toad. And of course, uh, very lovable, very charismatic, one of my favorites. Um, and one of the ways we tell them apart is we have two toads. Uh, we have the American toad and the Fowler's toad. And if you're in Northwest Indiana, you have Fowler's toad somewhere near you. And I'm very jealous um, that you can tell them apart a few ways. Uh, the American toad, uh, we look for these bumps on their skin. People call them warts. They're not actually warts. These are clusters of toxin glands. Um, so very cool. Um, they're a highly terrestrial species. So they're trying to not get eaten as they're moving through terrestrial habitat. And the best way to do that is cover your body in toxins. Um, certainly. So they have um, these, these clusters of these toxin glands and they have kind of dark circles below them. And in the American toad, uh, you'll see between one and three of these clustered toxin glands or warts um, in each of these dark spots, but not usually more than three. Um, when we take a look at the Fowler toad, they usually have like four or five. Um, so if you see a toad that just has like one or two, it's probably an American toad, but that's just one of the ways to tell them apart. 
Another way to tell them apart is that the American toad has this heavily spotted belly, um, lots of splotches and kind of charcoal and black coloration on its uh, underside. And um, another way to tell them apart is by looking at the top of their head. And this is really one of the best ways to distinguish them aside from the call. Um, all the toads have, different species of toads have these crests or ridges on top of their head. And these are called cranial crests. And different species of toads have different shape cranial crests and different positions of the cranial crest. Um, so our American toad has this kind of L-shaped crest where it's like at a right angle behind the eye. And they all have this large gland, it's called the paratoid gland. And in the American toad, this crest, there's a little space between the crest and the large paratoid gland. And sometimes it's connected by a spur, sometimes there's just a gap there. Um, but in the Fowler's toad, that crest is right up against the gland, so you don't even really perceive the crest. So if you see something where you see that distinct L and a little space, then you know you're you're going to be looking at an American toad. Um, so these are widespread and highly adaptable. They do okay in urban and suburban gardens and parks, and we find them in our backyard. Um, and that's the only amphibian or reptile I've seen in my backyard. So I'm always super excited to see a toad. Um, but they have a really pretty trill call. Um, and unlike the chorus frog, which is an escalating trill, this is the same note. It's like a sustained note. So that's one of the ways you can tell it apart. So we'll listen to that trill and then you'll hear some gurgling and um, that's more of the male territorial calls that we'll be hearing. That's an angry toad. So one thing I wanted to show you um, is from our calling frog survey data, we can look at the proportion of, of our sites, our survey sites that have been occupied in given years. And I had been doing some trend analyses um, with the different species going back to about uh, 2004 um, through 2021. And toads are pretty steady. They're in about 60% of the sites. But one thing that we find is here in 2012, and here in 2021, they were down below 50%. And those were both extremely severe drought years in our area. So when the ponds dry, because they're breeding, usually late April is early for them, but usually they start breeding in early May. That's when most of the temporary and semi-permanent ponds were dry in those years. So they have to go further to try to find a breeding site and they may not find a breeding site. So if you think about that, and see that there's this kind of slow recovery following it at, that they have to recolonize these sites and start breeding in these sites again. Um, the more frequently we have droughts, the more impact that can have on that population. And that's just one example from the data that our community scientists have managed to collect over about 18 year period. Um, so our next species is the pickerel frog, and I know they look a lot like uh, the northern leopard frog, but this is a distinct uh, friend. Um, instead of oblong ovals, they have these kind of more squared off blotches, um, and they're in roughly parallel rows rather than kind of scattered um, in three or four um, kind of irregular um, rows. 
And they also have a little patch of yellow or gold coloration on the thigh and hind leg. And they're a little bit smaller. They only get to about three inches in length. And I'll show you a side-by-side -side photo. They're a little bit more snub nose. They have a little more of a blunt snout than the Northern Leopard Frog has. Um, so here they are side-by-side. -side. You can see the Pickerel Frog has these kind of square parallel blotches, whereas the northern leopard frog has ovals. And there's there's some middle ones. They're not just in two rows. Um, and you can't see the yellow in the leg here. But this guy, I know it's um, a little bit harder to perceive. But when you see them in person, um, the pickerel frog snout looks much more rounded than the northern leopard frog. Um, but we can tell them apart by the call. And um, also because the pickerel frog is really uncommon. Um, in the Chicago region, they are likely locally extinct and have not been documented since the late 1940s. We do have them in some pockets of northern Illinois, mostly north central Illinois, if you're familiar at all with Nechusa grasslands, uh, which is a nature conservancy site that has some remnant habitat. Um, they're still there. Um, if you go over to northwestern Illinois along the Mississippi River, they do occur in places there. Um, but the reason we've lost most of them is because they live in um, sites with groundwater fed streams and groundwater fed ponds. And we've so altered and destroyed our hydrology in the region that the habitat just isn't there for this species. Um, so they used to occur in kind of open wooded areas with this cold groundwater kind of seep. Um, and you know you can find them in a handful of places. Um, so if you hear one, um, certainly let me know because I want to come there and and check them out. Um, they would chorus um, really beginning now and into May, and the call is a harsh snore. So it kind of sounds, I think, like an angry cow mooing. Um, it's kind of described as a meow. It's like kind of sound. Forgive my poor uh, impression. <laughs> So it's all snore. Distinctive arc. I think they sound like those little animal toys, like the cow in a can, farmyard toys that you could turn over and they would moo. Um, that's one of the ways that I would remember them. Um, another species that also looks kind of like the northern leopard frog, but is also a habitat specialist and far less common is the plains leopard frog. And this is a species that's more of a sand prairie specialist. Um, so they look like the northern leopard frog. They are related, um, but they have um, much more polka dotty pattern. So where the northern leopard frog has ovals, they have much more of a circular pattern and it's usually green inside those dots rather than dark brown and their back color tends to be a little bit more tan rather than green. Um, they also have this distinctive white spot in the middle of their tympanum, their eardrum. And so the Northern Leopard Frog's tympanum is all solid brown or tan. Um, it doesn't have the white spot. Another way we can tell them apart is by that dorsolateral ridge that we looked at. Um, in the Northern Leopard Frog, it goes all the way down the back. In the Plains Leopard Frog, there's this break right here. It's called an interrupted, weak or broken dorsolateral ridge. So it stops and then Sometimes it starts again, but I have seen some where it doesn't continue. It just kind of stops right behind their hip. Um, and in some, it just kind of tapers um, without that abrupt stop. But this is kind of your classic Plains Leopard Frog Ridge. So if you look at them side by side, you can see that light white spot on the eardrum. You see the more circular pattern rather than the oval. And um, you see the break in the ridge versus that nice, complete, bold ridge going down their back. 
and um, they are rare in the region. We find them in sites where there's remnant sand prairie. So places like Medeowin National Tallgrass Prairie and Goose Lake Prairie, um, they, they like those sites. Um, and they, they may be in a few other sites as you go further south um, and kind of along the state line, potentially at Kankakee Sands. Um, and their call is kind of like the Northern Leopard Frog, but without the snore, it's just the chuck. So they go chuck, 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 chuck. So we'll hear some other frogs in this recording. You'll hear cricket frogs at first, and then you'll hear gray tree frogs, but then you'll hear the um, plains leopard. And I'll just raise my hand when the call plays. Those are cricket. So it's a subtle thing, but you'll hear them in a mix and they tend to occur with certain other species like cricket frogs. So our next two are the gray tree frogs of the region. And we do have two morphologically identical species, the Eastern gray tree frog and the Cope's gray tree frog. They look the same, but their call is different and they're genetically distinct. Um, the Cope's gray tree frog is a diploid organism, has two copies of the genome. The uh, Eastern is tetraploid, it has four copies. Um, and so that they do have this genetic barrier um, that make them distinct species as well as their calls, um, are, which are distinct, but they will um, sometimes, in, certainly in Northern Illinois, we find them in distinct watersheds. Um, and in Indiana, I believe you mostly had Easterns, but there are some sites where people have reported copes. So you have to um, listen to the call to tell which one you have. Um, so they'll look the same. So I'll do the same description for them. They are the largest of our regional tree frogs, about two inches in length. And they have this patterning on their back. They can change color between gray and green. But the idea is to blend in with the lichens on the branches of the trees and the stem of the tree. So they have a lot of this modeling and they have a light green spot under the eye and big sticky toe pads. These guys are great at climbing. We often find them sitting under like parking lot lights and by people's garages if you have a light because they'll sit there to try to eat moths that are aggregating under, under light sources. Um, so they do take advantage of our forms of light pollution in the area. Um, but they have this bright, almost mustard yellow stripe um, on their thigh and hind leg and big kind of a balloon um, vocal pouch that can really make that sound carry quite far. So they like heavily wooded areas and in our area, they're kind of patchy, but where they do occur, they tend to be in large numbers. So they're not in every site, but the sites where you find them, they tend to be quite populous. And um, they'll both call around mid spring, early summer, so May and June is really the call, the core of their call. And the Eastern gray sounds kind of like um, red-bellied woodpecker. It's, it's got kind of a birdy, flutey trill. There's the code. <laughs> So it's it's much more kind of fluty, um, kind of musical trill. But when we listen to the copes, it's essentially the same call, but compressed into a much shorter time span. So it actually sounds more insect-like and more metallic, and it sounds kind of like a cicada song. So we'll listen to that. Left. 
there was one really close to the microphone in that recording. <laughs> um, so then, um, so that's how you tell those two apart, that really rapid compressed call versus the more flute-like call. So then we're into our late breeding species. I know I'm getting close on time, so <laughs> I'll try to go at a good clip. Um, but um, we're, we're near the, nearing the end stretch with these guys. Uh, we have our green frogs, and these are one of the more common species in the region I'm sure we're all familiar with. Um, green frogs are the second largest of our true frogs um, next to the bullfrog, and they can be green or brown in color, and these are going to use permanent bodies of water. One of the ways we can tell them apart from a bullfrog is, again, looking at that ridge on the back. The green frogs have this ridge that goes around the eardrum, or the tympanum, and then it extends about two thirds of the way down the back and basically tapers off. It doesn't go all the way to the end of their body. In the bullfrogs, they don't have that extension at all. They just have the ridge around the eardrum. So that's one of the ways we can tell them um, apart. And rule of thumb, if you wanna impress your friends and influence uh, acquaintances, you can tell males and females of green frogs and bullfrogs apart by the size of the eardrum relative to the size of the eye. So the males have a larger diameter eardrum than the diameter of their eye. If you see a frog with um, a green or bullfrog with a tympanum the same size or smaller than the diameter of the eye, then it's a female. So this is clearly a male green frog. Um, and here's a female for comparison. And they like these really kind of heavily vegetated, semi-permanent bodies of water or permanent bodies of water. And that's because the green frogs take about a year for their tadpoles to go through metamorphosis. So they'll actually overwinter in the pond. And so if you go over to the pond edge in spring and you see these really big tadpoles, they're either green frog or bullfrog tadpoles from a previous season. They're not from this year. Um, so they take their time because the idea is to be as big as possible um, when you go through metamorphosis so that you stand more of a chance of, of surviving. Um, and their call is really distinctive. It sounds like a loose banjo string being plucked. So we'll listen to that. And I want to play the sound they make when you walk up and they get scared and jump in the water um, because it sounds like it's from a completely different animal. <laughs> it sounds like a much daintier frog, but those are green frogs too, just making their little startle call and trying to get away from you. So they have that, that um, banjo string and then they do the little squeak. Um, our next species is the cricket frog, and this is also one that we mentioned that went through that, that decline um, after the 1960s and is, is uh, rare in quite a number of Midwestern states. This is the smallest frog in the region. Um, they only get to about an inch in length or less. And they have really variable color pattern. They can be brown and tan. They can have this kind of moss green stripe or rusty orange stripe. Um, and they have little warty projections on their skin, but unlike a toad, they don't have that big paratoid gland and they don't have those cranial crests. Um, they also have this triangular pattern between their eye that's pretty distinctive. And they have these really thick black bars on their hind legs. And that's one of the ways to tell a cricket frog when you see it, you're looking for that triangular pattern and those thick black stripes as well as the bumpy skin. Um, and these are considered semi-aquatic. They breed in permanent bodies of water, but it's usually kind of slow flowing streams and large ponds. And they like slow, kind of shallow sloping banks where you kind of have a mud flat environment that they can sit and hop on and go in the water. And what's happened in a lot of our region is our, our stream systems are very eroded and the banks get undercut. And we just don't have a lot of systems with that nice gradual bank that they really like. 
Um, but we do still find them on the outskirts of the Chicago region and certainly in, in uh, places in Indiana, um, usually a little bit um, further away from urbanized areas. So they don't seem to be um, very skilled at crossing major roadways. We kind of have a, bound, a very distinct boundary with some of our major transportation corridors where we don't find them north of there, but they get right up to it. Um, so that, that really is an impediment to colonize colonizing new sites. And this is a late breeding species. They're going to start calling in May and they may call into June or July. And we heard them in the uh, tree frog or the plains leopard frog uh, recording before. They sound like crickets. So it's a series of ticks like you're clicking uh, pebbles together. So it's something that you might mistake for a cricket, but if you hear it during the day, it's actually going to be a cricket frog. And if you go to places like Medeo and National Tall Grass Prairie, there they have a lot of them there. Uh, that's a good place to hear them. So um, the Indiana special, the Fowler's Toad, um, this is one I really wish we had by us. Um, this is, I think, our, our penultimate frog of the evening. Um, these guys, um, remember I was talking about the number of warts per spot, and um, they tend to be a little bit lighter in color, a little more tan with distinctive dark kind of patches. And you can see that they have one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five of those warts per spot. There's a few with little patches where there's two, but you don't tend to see these large clusters of those toxin glands um, in the American toads. Um, so that's something we pay attention to when we're trying to distinguish them. And we also don't see that distinctive L-shaped cranial crest with the little gap. Their crest is actually right up against the gland on their head, so you can't see that distinctive L shape. They also have a plain or nearly unspotted belly compared to the American toad, which has like patterning all over its belly. So that's another way you could tell them apart, but um, by far, the best way to tell them apart is by their call. And historically um, around Lake Michigan, they were restricted to a lot of sandy areas. So they would have been in Lake and Cook County in Illinois, and they are still at, uh, at the dunes. Um, and they make the most hilarious call. Um, people describe it as a sheep caught in a trap. Um, <laughs> so don't you wish you had this calling and serenading you in the evening? Let's play it. I don't think you'll mix that up with any other species. <laughs> I love how in your face they are. <laughs> they're just, they're great. It was actually one of my coworkers ringtones on her cell phone for a while, which I loved. We're in a meeting. <laughs> um, but here you see the side by side um, with an American toad. And this is actually a darker uh, colored Fowler's toad where you can see those nice crests with the space in the American toad, and you really can't make out the crest at all in the Fowler's toad. And then we see these larger clusters of spots with multiple kind of warts in them um, versus, you know, just two, no more than three in the American toad. And here's their bellies side by side. So Fowler's toad, again, pretty much a plain belly versus the very spotted belly. <laughs> <laughs> of the American toad. Um, 
So that brings us to our last frog of the evening, which is the bullfrog, the American bullfrog. And um, here you can really see uh, they can be quite variable in color going from green to brown, but sometimes you'll find some that have this interesting modeling or almost marbled coloration. Um, and we can see that distinctive ridge that just goes around the eardrum. It doesn't go down the back at all. And so that's going to tell you this is a bullfrog and not a green frog. And what do we think, male or female? It's it's a female. <laughs> um, small tympanum in this one. And um, yeah, there's the answer for that question. Um, but these can get up to about eight inches in length. So small kitten size. Um, I've caught some where, you know, I was trying to hold one with two hands and needed one of my interns to come grab it with an additional hand because they are so strong and they are good dispersers. And because of that, both green frogs and bullfrogs are actually increasing in abundance in the region because they can disperse. They can take advantage of things like golf course ponds and stormwater detention basins and other, um, you know, uh, anthropogenic sources of water like backyard ponds and things like that that we create. So here we have, again, that bullfrog just has the ridge around the eardrum, and the green frog has that extended ridge that just goes part way down the back and stops. And so they can really, you know, be variably green or brown, um, depending on the individual and the habitat that they're in. But um, we'll, we'll listen to their call because, of course, the green frog has the banjo, the bring, bring kind of sound and bullfrog is your jug -or rum or vroom um, kind of call. So this is our characteristic bullfrog sound. And when you startle them, instead of doing a high-pitched squeak, they do a thwack and a splash. So it sounds like you're hitting a drum. So we'll play that. So I want to show you the coolest color aberration yet. Um, so there is a mutation in bullfrogs where they lack yellow pigment and that gives us blue bullfrogs. And, and actually there are green frogs with this too, but I've only seen this in bullfrogs in my area. Um, so it occurs once in a blue frog, as we say. And when you, you see it, you can really spot them from a distance because it almost looks <laughs> like, like it's fake. It's just this turquoise frog sitting amongst the duckweed and here's the same individual up close. And you can see this, there's no filter here. This is, there's my hand. Um, it's really a beautiful color and a beautiful eye color. And what's cool about this mutation is sometimes it affects the whole frog, but here's an individual also hugely um, full of eggs, <laughs> this female. Um, she's like Jabba the Hutt here. And um, her face is green, but you can see that she has this blue coloration further back and part of her body. She's very muddy, so you can't see it very well, but I've seen other people's photos where they also have this like on part of their body. So it's really neat. It, it's not just localized to our area. It occurs in the Northeast as well and in other parts of the Midwest, but um, super cool. So if you do want to learn more about frog monitoring or you want to revisit any of these calls or any of those natural history tidbits, um, you can visit Frog Survey org we have the recordings on the website so you can play them and practice to get a better sense of what you're hearing and um, because it's after our recruitment window if you do have photos or recordings or videos of frogs that, or any amphibians and reptiles really that you encounter um, I'm part of a group uh, called Midwest partners in amphibian and reptile conservation um, 
we work with another community science program called Hurt Mapper that does atlasing um, of observations. And we're trying to do a phenology pro project across a seven state Midwestern region, looking at differences in activity patterns for all the amphibians and reptiles. So you can go to phenology.mwparc, midwestpark.org, um, and you can upload your observations. And it just shows things to the county level. So even if you find something rare, you're not giving away um, a sensitive location. Um, those species are already masked by experts who run this. But um, what, what's cool is you can see in real time where different species are active around you. So you could say, you know, are, are toads calling yet? You can look at the map and see real time information. So the more we contribute to it, the better this works. Um, so with that, I'll thank you. And um, if there's time, I'll, I'll take any questions. Thank you so much, Allison. That was amazing. Oh, you're um, we're, before we jump into questions, um, we're going to do like our little wrap up stuff yeah. real quick and then we'll, then we'll go to the questions. We've got a few um, in the chat. If you have others, um, please type them in and we'll do as many as we can. Um, I'm going to share my screen real quick. So um, Allison recommended these two books for us, Bringing Nature Home, How You Can Sustain Wildlife with Native Plants, and um, Eye of Newt and Toe of Frog, Adder's Fork and Lizard's Leg, The Lore and Mythology of Amphibians and Reptiles. So um, if you are our lucky winner, we'll pick two lucky winners here. Um, if you're our lucky winner, um, you can choose which book you would like. So, Christine, are you here? Erin, can you check? Christine? I am checking. Um, I don't, I don't see a Christine unless. I don't see one either. I do not see a Christine. All right, we're, we gotta be here to win. We're choosing another one. Marie, is Marie here? Unless Marie is a Mary. Nope, Marcy. we have Marie's and Mary's. Nope. Nope. All right. Oh, come on. We always get the three people who don't show. Always. Never fails. James Wicks. James. There's a James here. We have two James. There's James oh. Wicks and James something with an S. Please speak up, James, if you're here. You may unmute. I am James S, he says. Oh, no. Oh. <laughs> Other James. Oh, gosh. All right. We're going to keep listening to our spunky little song. Gerald? Yeah, you're here. Yes, I'm here. Yeah, oh, all right, we have a winner. <laughs> Excellent. Um, if you want to send me a message with which book you'd like, and I'm gonna, we'll get one more winner here. Uh, the first one. Okay. Marcy. Marcy is here. Oh, Marcy here. Oh, yay, that's exciting. <laughs> all right, there we go. Um, I, let's see, Erin, if you want to do the, I'll just keep sharing and you can do the, um, the ending part here and then we'll do a few questions. Sure. Um, thank you everybody for being here tonight. We have some upcoming workshops um, coming up that will be in person. So we're like very excited. I love the virtual ones, but also very excited to get together in person. On May 7th, we have forest bathing with Cynthia Smith. Um, we'll have two sessions. So come on out for a nice relaxing hike with us and, and, and try that. Um, on June 18th, we also have Wild Edibles of the Dunes with Ezekiel Flannery. Um, so we're really, really excited about that. Come, come learn about those, those things that you can try and taste. Um, those plants that we have in the dunes. July 7th, we have Leave No Trace for educators. Um, and so we're really excited to Leave No Trace crew will be coming through Indiana and they're going to make a stop with us. And then on August 20th, we have the Lee Bot Celebration at the Learning Center. So Check out our website if you're interested and, and come join us. 
We also have summer camp this year, back to full capacity, and we are so excited. Um, if you have any campers, children in your life, um, we have residential camps starting at nine years old all the way up to 17. Um, and then we also have day camps for our younger kids, um, five to six, seven to eight, and six to eight, yeah. So check out our website if you're interested in sending kids to camp and, and join us for some fun outside. Go outside, everybody. It will get warmer this week too, enjoy it. <laughs> All right, um, we've got just a minute or two left. So we'll we'll throw a few rapid fire questions at Allison. Um, why do peepers stop when temps cool down and then start up again? Um, well, because they're ectotherms. So their physiology and their, their metabolism is all governed by what the ambient temperature is. So for most of our early breeding frogs, we need it to be at least about 45 degrees Fahrenheit for them to sustain, have enough energy to sustain a call. Um, and another thing that can influence their calling is wind speed. So usually if it's over 12 miles an hour, they tend to stop calling because that will dry out their skin and it's energetically expensive to keep trying to call over the wind when they're not going to be heard. So when it kind of drops down, that's that's just rest breaks for, for the frogs. And then when it warms up, they have to get back to it. Interesting. Okay, cool. Um, next question. What is the typical lifespan of these frogs and toads? Ooh, that varies <laughs> quite a bit. Um, so uh, the cricket frog, which is... Um, probably one of the more rare ones in the region, the one that went through that decline throughout the Midwest, they only um, live about a year or two. So they have essentially an annual life cycle. Um, they will reach reproductive maturity in their first year breed and maybe they'll make it through another winter, but they don't live much longer than that. Um, with wood frogs, um, the males don't reach reproductive maturity till they're two and the females, it takes them three years to reach reproductive maturity. Beyond that, it's it's kind of an open question of if predators get them, if conditions get them, but um, estimating around eight years. Now with bullfrogs, um, their tadpoles can spend sometimes up to three years in the pond overwintering and just getting bigger and bigger. Um, so beyond that, it's, it becomes very hard to estimate how old a frog is just from when it comes out of metamorphosis because with bullfrogs and green frogs, they can spend this extended window in the pond, but you could probably estimate somewhere near eight to 10 years for some of them, maybe longer. I know um, there were some skeletochronology studies done on specimens of um, some of the regional amphibians, so museum specimens, where they basically um, looked at growth rings because they just add layers of bone as they grow. And um, they aged one of the regional salamanders, the spotted salamander, to 32 years. So they can have very long life cycles, although salamanders tend to burrow and they spend about 90% of the time underground while the frogs are out and about a bit more. So I would I would estimate around a decade for, for some shorter, for some of the smaller species like the cricket frogs and peepers. Wow, I would never have thought that long. Yeah, <laughs> so. yeah. well, and, and actually that's one of the things that makes their populations really resilient when we do have years and years of drought because mm -hmm. they'll, when they do breed, they, they can lay between hundreds to tens of thousands of eggs depending on the species. And, you know, that's a lot of reproductive effort. And if everything dries up or if you have a year where they, where they lay eggs and then everything freezes and it eliminates all of their eggs for that season, they need to be able to be resilient. So the populations do have some capacity to rebound from that as long as it doesn't happen every single year. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, what size is the green frog? Oh, um, probably up to about six inches long. Um, they can be small, you know, certainly smaller ones, but I think the biggest that I've seen is probably about six inches long. Um, someone asked about a protected, are frogs protected species? So I'm sure it varies species to species. Right. It, it varies very much based on which species you have. A lot of the more rare species in the region, um, we tend to, 
have um, kind of this catch all of species and greatest conservation need. And that often means that we're data deficient in terms of how much population level data we have to show, oh, yes, there's been this precipitous decline. Often what happens with these populations is they're there and then they're not. So we don't necessarily have that much information or as much information as we'd like to have when we designate something as threatened or endangered. But um, certainly uh, in Indiana, one of the state listed species is the crawfish frog, which is a Southern Indiana species. We don't, we don't have them up around the Chicago region, but they are very rare um, and live in crayfish burrows um, and also are explosive breeders and they come out in the rains and it's, it's a really cool thing. Um, but um, you know, a lot of them can, you know, people can take them for pets um, if they have like a fishing license in most states up to a certain number, like up to eight in Illinois. Um, but if there are species in greatest conservation need or if they're threatened or endangered, you would need additional permits to have them. Interesting. Okay. Um, Marcy says, I have seen some floating stretched out in a lagoon by Miller Woods and Gary when it is cold. Are they in hibernation? Um, no, uh, Miller Woods and Gary. Uh, so usually what you may have seen is actually, uh, were they wood frogs? Do you know? Um, because after wood frogs um, mate and lay eggs, the males tend to kind of hang out in, in the water and they, they do this kind of splay legged float. And it's, because it's that may, very, they may have been, that may have been. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a very distinctively like wood frog posture. Yeah. Um, so it's usually when they're, when they're kind of guarding the egg area and chasing other males off, they'll, they'll just kind of float there. Like, uh, don't come into my turf. And if another one swims up, they'll call at them and swim after them. And they get into these little scuffles. And they're also just kind of waiting to see if there's any kind of females that are kind of behind schedule of everybody else, um, that might show up. And then they're like, Hey, I'm right here here so um yeah nice. um and last one here and then we'll wrap it up you mentioned keratin but i don't know the significant significance of this um so keratin um it's you know the same thing that our, our hair and fingernails are made of and so keratin um is the protective layer of the skin and so in larval amphibians like um, the tadpoles and salamander larvae, they don't actually have that protective coating on their skin because they're just breathing completely through that and passing water and nutrients through that. And they have keratin just on the mouth parts. So the mouth parts are used to kind of graze and scrape algae off of um, you know, logs that are underwater and submerged vegetation. And so keratin um, protects the skin. So as they go through metamorphosis, they actually add layers and they add um, a couple of layers of keratin to the body as they move into the terrestrial habitat because then that's going to help pr protect them from getting like scraped or cut um, as they move through the forest or the marsh. Um, but it's also important because with the chytrid fungus that causes the uh, chytridiomycosis disease, it actually breaks down the keratin. So it can attach to the mouth parts of the tadpoles and digest that. And so that can impede their ability to feed. If it's a small infection, it can then kind of hang on to the mouth parts and then spread as the skin develops more keratin. And that's what, because they breathe through that, it basically kind of acts like a cover and impedes their ability to, to respire. Crazy. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. Wow. Um, so lots of great comments of people who love the presentation. Thank you uh, all thank so you. much for coming. Um, we really appreciate it. And we hope to see you in person at our one of our upcoming events. Hooray. So, um, thank you again. Thank you so much, Allison. Um, it was great to have you with us tonight. Um, oh, thanks for the invite. <laughs> yeah. And hopefully everybody, everybody go out and listen for some frogs. <laughs> Have a good night, everyone. Thanks so much for coming. Mm -hmm.